Hi, Zandy. You know, in most of our episodes, I'm introducing you to an author of a new book looking for ways to apply key ideas from what they've written. But every once in a while, I come across someone who I just think is interesting, someone who brings a fresh perspective to the discussion that would help all of us who want to get better at leading teams and delivering projects. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Jen Derry. Jen is the founder of a company that champions the concept that all humans are creative, resourceful, and whole, but sometimes they have a hard time moving forward. And Jen and her team help people move forward through coaching and manager trainings. In today's discussion, Jen will share her insights on issues and situations that we often find ourselves in, like struggles when moving into a management role and knowing what to hold on to and what to let go of. How about this? Delivering bad news, as well as how to deal with it when the bad news is delivered to us. Jen will share lessons that she's learned about balancing work and life and giving some coaching insights for anyone who's recently lost your job and you want to move forward. And how about this? We've even got some ideas for those of you who are still in your job, but questioning whether you should stay. Jen will share some perspective on that as well. It's a fun discussion with an insightful human that I can't wait to share with you. Hey, quick question. You know, it's hard to miss the constant stream of announcements about what feels not human, AI tools and other capabilities, right? I mean, it's not always clear. Like, how do these technologies actually benefit us as leaders of teams and projects? Well, that's why my team and I have developed a new e-learning offering, AI Made Simple, a practical guide to using AI in your everyday work. It's a self-guided course specifically designed for leaders like you who want to harness the power of AI, enhance the work you do, but really staying ahead of the curve in this fast-changing world of business. We can streamline your workflow, boost your productivity. AI Made Simple is all about that. Don't miss out on this opportunity to learn practical strategies for leveraging AI in your everyday work. Learn more and start learning at peopleandprojectspodcast.com slash AI. Thanks. Let's jump into today's discussion with Jen Derry. Jen, thank you for joining us on the People and Projects Podcast. Andy, I could not be more excited about this afternoon's conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to, yo, know, as a leadership coach and a business owner, and how about this, a brain tumor survivor, a mom, a founder, I'm guessing you didn't chart that path out <laughs> at age eight. So what did the late teenager or early 20s version of Jen think she'd be doing someday? Oh, man, it's so funny to look back, right? Because it's obviously not a linear path, mm -hmm. probably not for many of us, yeah. but um, you can see little signposts along the way. Mm -hmm. I would say in high school, I was the co-editor in chief of our newspaper. And so oh. I definitely saw myself going into a writing direction. But when you're 17, 18 years old, and you are having the experience of telling other people what to do, the yeah. deadlines we have to meet. At this point, we have exacto knives and sort of the wax boards, <laughs> the light boards, right? This is like back in the stone age, I guess. Right. Um, but there is certainly early developing skills of leadership, of pressure, uh, how to keep people together, also how to ask a lot of someone without burning them out. And so I don't think I really knew exactly where I was going, but I, I really loved that experience, right, of, of newspaper stuff. And then I went to college and I studied literature and writing and French, and I really liked that language stuff. I love the beginning of learning languages because it's just all good faith, right? You're like, and you you prefer a bath or a shower? Like what, <laughs> what vocab do you have? Nothing, right? Andy? Exactly. So, so you're hearing like the most intimate things from someone who's next right. to you in Spanish class or whatever. Right. Um, right. And so again, I wasn't exactly sure where I was going with that, but I was following what um, energized me, I guess. Yeah, I'll say. Right. Yeah. 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 I, and I think you're exactly right that, that for very few people, like I, I worked to this one person, uh, it's pretty early in my career, but she just had this plan out. Like, and then by that time, the kids will be 12. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to medical right. school. And then I'm going to, I mean, she had it for like a, this 50 year plan and I'm actually not making fun of her. I mean, I, I respect that sort of intentionality, but I'm quite sure it probably didn't roll out that way. Right. And because yeah. sometimes you don't even know what you love until you try some other things. And my, my take is you found your sweet spot. Like you found what you love, even though you didn't chart it out at the time. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's entirely right. And when I hear about those kinds of spreadsheets, there's definitely part of me that's like, damn, I got to go make a spreadsheet right now. You know, yeah, like yeah. that sounds so great because there is a, a real 
like driven part of me that does want to accomplish check, check, check. And yeah. there's another part of me that feels like that sort of tool can also be a bit fear-based, mm. which is that I don't know if I believe I will get something good. So I'm going to try to strong arm a good life out of it. And that is where there's, um, you know, room for all of us to kind of adult in a better way, I would say, you know, um, mm -hmm. in a way that we are more mature and we realize that whatever comes, you can make something beautiful out of it. We're going to talk at some point about yeah. people who are losing their jobs. It's yeah. a tough yeah. moment for that. Right. Yeah. And um, I don't want to sort of deny grief that comes with those sorts of things. But at the same time, the world is really big and there's a lot that could happen in yeah. bad ways too, but it also in amazing ways. And so sometimes I think the most unexpected things arrive and you didn't have it on your spreadsheet. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. In fact, I could probably say that some of the most important pivots in my life so far were not requested, <laughs> certainly not <laughs> desired, but ended up being something that turned out to be good, you know? And yeah. um, I, I, when I first became a manager, the, the guy who told me about it, he goes, did you ever think you could someday be a manager? And I, I, I wanted to be nice to him, but I was like, yeah, I like, I envisioned that one, you know, like I, I aspired to that. I worked hard for it and stuff like that, but there are other things that were not that case, but I, you know, since you work with new managers, I, I'm curious, curious, your experience, like what are some of the circumstances around the first time you moved into management and maybe even some of the mistakes you made then and how do you see those repeated with people you work with? Well, the funny thing was that before I was a manager, I was the director of employee development at an agency, ah. which means that I was doing a lot of the manager, let's say bullet points. I was having one-on-ones mm. with people, taking them out for coffee, looking at resourcing, making, you know, sort of career level conversations happen and feedback and all that. But I wasn't officially in charge of them, right? And I, I couldn't, I wasn't their boss. I couldn't um, promote, let's say I had influence there, but I, it wasn't my uh, call at the end of the day. So the first time I became a manager and had someone report to me, I was like, no problem. I got this. I literally do this all the time in my job anyway. Mm. But it was a huge blind spot for me. Mm. Like I'm really good at, for the most part, reading people, having a sense for like, are you into me? Are you not into me? And this report, it was like a black box. I was like, I can't tell if she thinks I'm like Oprah or the devil. I really, <laughs> and it was a wide spectrum, Andy. I really couldn't see it. And so I went to, a, you know, kind of my closest buddy on the leadership team. And I was like, I need to ask you something. Any, any instinct or detail or feedback or whatever you hear about this report, can you bring it to me? Because I can't see it. Mm -hmm. So if you hear that, uh, she's enjoying the experience. Great. If you hear that, that's not the case. Great. Because I needed to kind of triangulate at that moment. I mean, you know, it's a really strange spot. It's, it's like parenting. And then all of a sudden you realize you are kind of your parents, you know, you're like, Oh crap. <laughs> I didn't think I'm it was becoming happening. my mother. <laughs> exactly. And, and so you get a report and suddenly that power structure um, creates almost like a, a filter. Mm. And so I, I do think that people have a similar experience when they become managers, if they assume that manager is just a title change. Mm. Mm. And it's a heavier decision if, if it's not just a title change. If you do absorb the power of the agency, the feeling that, yes, I am going to have to make potentially some hard decisions and certainly have hard conversations with this person, instead of just like, Nah, we're good. We're same. We're still going to get lunch together. We're the same. It's just, uh, I got a new title, right? Mm -hmm. That is usually at least a tiny part of the beginning experience of what I've found new managers to have, which is, no, 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 we're still the same. I just have this new job description, except That's you're not. Good. And what I always counsel my new uh, managers in my programs is succinctly, you have to find new friends. Mm. I know it sounds so rough and it doesn't mean you can't have relationships still mm. and social moments with those folks, but you should always vent sideways and up. Mm. And so any like frustration or whatever shouldn't be shared with that same population of people moving forward. Mm. That's yeah. hard to hear. That's good. Can, can you think of other, uh, other aspects of that, of the, you need new friends that, that mm. you find resonate with people? Well, 
you know, another kind of structure that I talk through is the idea that, um, you know, you know, some of those glasses that you can put on that, um, like 3D stuff or whatever, right? The, <laughs> the filter on the glasses allows you to see something else. And I yeah. often say that when you move into a new role identity, like a new manager, it's like somebody gave you glasses and the same exact picture uh, what, what looks the same to everyone else, suddenly you have a deeper um, connection or, or mm -hmm. understanding is a better word for. Mm -hmm. One example of that would be money. Mm -hmm. You now have a set, an understanding of what people make, mm -hmm. including where you are sometimes in that scale yeah. of things. And the same picture, which looked like, oh, look at all these founders making all this cash over here actually isn't always the case because mm. brick and mortar buildings cost things and insurance costs things and HR costs things and health insurance costs things. And once you start to get deeper and deeper into those rooms and those conversations and those budgets, it's like, oh, snap, I did not get it. Yeah. And you shouldn't have gotten it because you weren't yet in those rooms. Yeah. But yeah. that transition moment shows you that like, there are people I can now have confidential conversations with about this detail. And there are definitely people I shouldn't be bringing mm -hmm. that confidential information. So I use the word friends there, like get new friends. Cause I think, you know, in this modern age work is very social, yeah. but I, what I really mean is new confidants also, mm -hmm. you know, a new trusted uh, network of sort. Yeah, that's good. You know, something I started with over my leadership journey is just figuring out what do I hold on to and what do I delegate? Is to left in my own devices. I just easily hold on to things because I like them. You know, I can do them quickly. I know they'll be done right, at least how I define uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned personally about what to let go of or not? And what's something that you know to this day you probably ought to let go of more often than you do, but you don't? Tell us about that. I think I might go back to brain tumor story here mm -hmm. because it's one of the most obvious um, sort of trial by fires for me in delegation. Mm -hmm. First of all, just to normalize what you're talking about, I think underneath what you're saying is concepts of control mm -hmm. and um, probably a bit of perfectionism too, but also just a driven desire to do good stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the reason we hold so tightly to that stuff is you're like, I'm a known quantity. I know that I can strong arm this through. Although there's of course like a scalable limit to which we can hold on to things, which is usually where, you know, stuff hits the fan, if I can yeah. say. Yeah. Um, my, you know, we, I mean, we could talk for three hours, Andy, about brain tumor <laughs> stuff, but I will keep it succinct and say that in 2016, I was diagnosed with a meningioma brain tumor, um, which meant that it was very likely benign, but not necessarily. And I had an eight month old and a three year old. And so two weeks later I was in brain surgery and, um, you know, it was a pretty big, big tumor. It was about the size of a lemon behind my left eye. And so we didn't know anything about that. It was a very big surprise. And um, I have a memoir right now that I was actually editing this morning that will be published soon. And um, one of the the parts I was rereading this morning was this idea of um, there was a point at which I was still helpful. Mm -hmm. And then there was a moment where I was unhelpful because mm -hmm. they start giving you, you know, steroids mm -hmm. and all kinds of things to prepare. And so until I was helpful, what I understood was I needed to re-resource my life mm -hmm. and backfill for every dimension of myself. And that included, included weaning my son and figuring out what formula he was going to have. And that included who took the kids to daycare and Plucky had to close for six months and, you know, everything, who's cooking dinner, who's bringing, you know, people make meal trains. And, um, you know, in that sort of high emergency situation, I I didn't have a lot of time to be nostalgic about it. Mm -hmm. The baby needed to eat, you know. Yeah, right. So there are times in our lives, I think, when we swallow all of that processing that for a big event like that. And then certainly six months, a year later, that comes up and then you got to work on it, um, making peace with all those decisions that didn't go the way you thought they would. But that to me is a great example of a moment where it was like, I literally can't do these right. things. Right. I've yeah. got to delegate them to someone else. And, you know, that is, it would be a 
really great story if I was like, and never again, and right. never again did <laughs> never I be hesitate. Picked up again. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. annoyingly, here right. I am seven years later, and there certainly are things I still resist giving away, but maybe your listeners can also appreciate the fact that like we are finite. Mm -hmm. So a huge tool in that case would be prioritization and to say, understandably, there are 4 million things on the plate that you would love to touch reasonably. What are the seven things this week that you have the highest priority or the things that only you can do? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you cut bait, right? And mm -hmm. let's all be those people that don't hold the other ones around us accountable for every single thing. Let's be generous with our appreciation for delegation, the complications that come up with it. And in that way, we sort of encourage each other to delegate and that's okay. And dropped balls are dropped balls and not brain surgery, right? Like that's a really big perspective that is very helpful too. And in, in, you know, my work and my day-to-day -day frustrations with to-do lists and whatnot. So yeah, it's a long-winded way of saying it, but uh, if That's we are lucky story. enough, you know, to, to say, shoot, what, what can drop this week, then yeah, that's, that's a good day. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I, I love how you even started the whole story. I, I appreciate you sharing the backstory about the tumor, but yeah. how you start out with it, it, you know, there could be underlying things here of control and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, trust issues and all kinds of things that, that we're maybe not even aware of, but a lot of us got to our position because we were really good at that. And now, not only do we need new friends, so to speak, we also kind of, we have new habits we have to develop in this. And we can't do all that, but finding finding ways to let that go, and maybe you can think of examples, but I can think of examples where after letting go, some people surprised me. Like they did things so much better than what I would have expected, or they had this latent interest or these latent capabilities that I didn't even know. I mean, there's this richness yeah. available to us if we do it, but we're almost holding them back yeah. by not doing it, right? I mean, it sounds like even when you say that back to me, that is more of a scarcity mindset than an abundant mindset, mm -hmm. which is that there's scarcity and there's basically barely enough around here to make the whole thing not fall apart, you know, yeah. which if that's true, we got bigger problems in our businesses yeah. and in our teams. Yeah. So instead to sort of look the other way and say what, like, you know, what you just said, what might surprise me, where yeah. might the abundance be, in what ways can I be nimble or flexible about my expectations here? And let's see where it goes. I think you're totally right, Andy, in that the current system of rewards and recognition that we work in, in 2023 work styles, is we reward driven, we reward like, you know, head down, like drive real fast, accomplish real fast. Um, and that is like, a, I'm not going to throw shade there. That is helpful <laughs> for mm -hmm. on teams, people who actually do the group work, you know. Um, but there are different shapes of people on teams. And if all of them are like that, you don't have n any collaboration. Mm -hmm. So if you've got all of these, um, I would say almost like cowboy -y type independent, you know, give it to me, I'm going to run mm -hmm. real fast. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But then you all should go be freelancers. Yeah. If yeah. you're working together on a team, you have to compile the shapes of the people around you and figure out on this one, I'm going to take it and run next time you do that. Or, you know, I'll always be the glue in the middle. You know, we have all these interesting phrases like the, the mm -hmm. glue that keep people together. That's really valuable on a mm -hmm. team. And so that person, yeah. you know, might be overlooked in terms of recognition sometimes. Yeah. I'm thinking, uh, you know, as you go with metaphors, conductor is one that I've really fallen yeah. in love with over time because you can't play all the instruments. And it's not because of a brain tumor. You just literally cannot play every instrument. And yeah. finding a and if uh, as one guest told us, he goes, if that is how he said, he goes, if you were used to be the first chair violin and now you're the conductor, you, you got to remember that that new first chair conductor is going to suck compared to you. So you can't just grab the violin out of their hands. You have to find a way to develop right. them. And for some reason, that metaphor, along with the ones you mentioned, just yeah. kind of helps us rethink you know, our identity in that way. I mean, maybe I'll ask you a question backwards, not to get wild in this interview, and you're the interviewer, I get it. But what do you think people are afraid of? Like, why are we, what are we afraid of yeah. when we hesitate to delegate? Well, it's, a, it's a great question. Actually, this comes up often in discussions I have with people. And I think, I think I'd say it this way. The, the majority of people who I have this conversation with will say, if I delegate off and they drop the ball, I'm the one who takes the heat. 
Yeah. And, and so it, there's this sense of, and, and so I think it goes back to control and trust that you're talking about. But mm-hmm. the the thing is, if I try to, you know, because you know, the reward for good work is more work, right? So if, I, if I'm just juggling more and more and more and more, I'm going to drop the ball eventually myself anyway, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I just think it's interesting. I don't know. What's your take on that? I mean, I think that's at least part of it. I had an interesting conversation in a coaching call yesterday um, about our hesitation can I say this societally? I don't know. At least I guess I mean in the tech and um, project spaces in 2023 here in modern times, but our hesitation to be direct. Hmm. And so we want consensus. We want collaboration. We want everybody to feel good. We, you know, And leadership sometimes is making a call hmm. and saying, here's how it's going to go. I appreciate feedback, but given everything I've heard, this is where we're headed. And so the buck stops with you, right? Like I'm holding the bag, all these metaphors, but that is what the game is at some point. When you become a leader, you have to trust yourself that these are the right calls. And sometimes you'll make the wrong ones, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you shouldn't be in your chair, you know, Mm -hmm. as long as you absorb that and keep learning and move forward. And sometimes I think that our concept of leadership, um, airs a little too much on the side of like herding cats and coordination Mm -hmm. instead of, directing the cats Mm. and you know again people have their own human nature but also people fall in line i mean we've all been to school there's a teacher in the classroom you know (laughs) fall apart in those ways and so sometimes a bit of a firmer um directness i guess i'll say or Mm -hmm. plan people really can appreciate that yeah yeah that's a some good things to reflect on there you know Mm -hmm. um i'm trying to think of other things i i i've seen in myself and made too many mistakes on, and I see a lot of other people that, uh, how do we deal with bad news? So, for example, if somebody's struggling on a project, it's how do I how do I deal with it? And what I see too often, especially new majors, but I see it even if people have been around for a while, is too often things get sugar coated, or we just don't bring it up because you know why ruffle the feathers, you know? Yeah. And you know that could certainly lead to bigger problems. So, I'm interested in your take on both sides of the table. Some lessons you've learned about when you have to deliver bad news or you're coaching someone who has to deliver bad news. And then the other side of the table, when they're the person who's getting the bad news of some things to keep in mind. What's interesting is that when we have to give bad news, Mm -hmm. you know, first of all, there's a lot of people pleasing. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of us count that in our resumes, shall we say. Um, And so if you are someone who cares very much about the other person and the reception of the bad news, then you kind of enter into this la la land, I would say, where you are trying to make that person just not feel nervous about receiving bad news and not feel bad about the bad news when actually like the math of the situation means that is an entirely normal response. Mm -hmm. If the recipient of bad news is not feeling a little rough and nervous, what is happening, right? Like that, <laughs> if somebody gives you bad news, it would be really weird if you were, were like, be a month late. Hey. oh, that's great. Like, that's yeah, not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. So the energy tracks. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is not prevent nerves or bad feelings or awkwardness. You want to be calm with it mm-hmm. so that that person can take care of themselves and that they don't also have to handle your nervousness about mm-hmm. delivering bad news, right? That's an, a burden. I, I mm-hmm. talked through this with my new manager Uh, trainings when it comes to firing someone Mm. that when you go into the room to fire someone do not burden that person with your anxieties as well Mm. the biggest gift you could give them is to you be have it together be simple be clear and then allow them to process all the stuff going on because Mm. you know we are empathetic as humans and so they are although perhaps getting fired are going to worry that you're crying you know like i mean hold it together on that level so i would say that when you give bad news don't need for that to go well don't need for that to get like a pat on the back that you did so great be strong and confident enough that it's okay. That's expected behavior on the other part of that person. And that's why you're a leader, right? Like that's mm-hmm. why you're in the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could definitely go cry to someone later if it's, you know, nerve wracking for you. <laughs> right. That's okay. We need those friends, right? Or yeah. those partners. Yeah. In terms of hearing bad news, the power move is to 
hear it slowly and calmly, I would say. Mm -hmm. So like Andy, if you just came to me and you were going to tell me that you looked at my website and you thought it was trash, which it's not, but let's just say that you did that. <laughs> I would say, oh, interesting. Um, thanks for mentioning that. Can you give me some more details? Now, that's a power move because you didn't just destroy my soul. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, hmm, I may not agree with him. Why don't you give me some more details there? Yeah. So I've slowed that conversation down. I wasn't reactive. I wasn't angry. I didn't flip any tables. I've slowed it down. And then I've said, tell me some more details about that. Let's say you tell me more details. Then I might say, okay, I took some notes on that. I think... I think I need to go process this a little bit. Are you free in like an hour? Hmm. Uh, I'd like to pull it apart a little bit more with you. Mm -hmm. So now I've given myself some time and space to process it and come back. And I control the pacing. Hmm. So what I would say, if you are receiving bad news, do what you can to control that pacing because you don't just give up all your agency by receiving, you know, tough feedback. And all of us are going to have tough feedback at some point or another. Hmm. And so, um, yeah. I think that's what I would say. I love it because the way we react is basically training them whether they should continue giving us actual truth. <laughs> right, right. I, I could, I could, I could, I, I think about this as, as a parent uh, often, but I think of it as a leader too, that if, if some, you know, Jen, if you came up to me and gave me some bad news, like, well, Jen, make sure that doesn't happen. Or, you know, you know, that, that can't be true or. Yeah. 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 If, if I, if I make it clear, I'm not willing to hear the truth. People will stop bringing the truth <laughs> to me. So yeah, then you're that, screwed medium term. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but then the other side of the table, uh, your thoughts about don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Any thoughts on uh, that as an approach for bad news? I mean, yeah, it probably depends which direction you're going in the power structure. Right. Mm -hmm. So like people who are more C-suite or VP level, um, are going to probably more often say something like, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions, because their time is really, really, really thin. Mm -hmm. So for you to come and brainstorm your, um, God, I'm going to sound so like ruthless here, but for you to yeah. come and brainstorm your feelings with the VPN somewhere, <laughs> yeah. like right. depending on your relationship with them, that mm -hmm. may not be your first course of action. Mm -hmm. So if your organization is larger and people have not a lot of time, then what you want to do with bad news or, hey, we're going to miss this deadline or whatever, is not just say we're going to miss the deadline, but also say, and therefore, dot, dot, mm -hmm. dot. So I think that goes along with what you're saying. But mm -hmm. I will also say that we need people in our networks and in our workplaces that we don't always have to solve the problem, that we can have a safe and neutral space to, you know, parse things out. Uh, that's why coaches are helpful, or sometimes folks in people ops or HR. And the other thought I will add there is sometimes you have a friend or a partner or a coworker that you just need to clarify what hat you need them to wear. Mm -hmm. So this happens for my husband and I, <laughs> like he will, he will come to me with a work thing and I will say, what you want me to wear wife or coach hat? What am I doing? Here? Right. And so that clarifies which, which part of me do you need? And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, when we, when we want to um, kind of process more than deliver news, Mm -hmm. that might be a helpful um, thing to yeah. keep in mind. I love it because I, I feel like the don't bring me problems, bring me solutions works the vast majority of the time when I'm the person delivering the bad news. But there are times yeah. where I find where people don't know a solution or they don't have the answers. And then what they use that as, well, I'm not going to communicate it only to mm -hmm. find out that makes the problem worse. And so even though it works most of the time, having, I like how you said that, of having are there people you can go to and make sure it's clear what hat you want them? Are they yes. going to wear the problem solving? Like sometimes my wife will go, honey, I don't want you to say anything. <laughs> just listen. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, so that's the role of the cat at this point. <laughs> just, yeah, just listen, <laughs> just listen, be around me, you know, but, uh, but, that's but so making funny. that clear. I, I love it. You know, as a, as a business owner, as a parent, there's no, there's no shortage of demands on your life. And so I'm, I'm just interested because that was part of your journey of the thinking deeply about what do I want to do and uh, how does that work for me? So some lessons you've learned about work-life balance and that you know now, but you didn't learn in a textbook. Like It's almost like you had to learn these lessons by going through. What have you learned? I mean, the big word that stands out to me in that question or as a response to that question is the yeah. concept of seasons. Mm -hmm. You can't set and, and forget it for the rest of your life in terms of here's the work-life balance I want. So, but what we can approach it with is seasonality, which is mm -hmm. that, okay, for Q1, 
I have this stuff going on with, I'm just making this up, my family, mm. my kids, you know, outside of work. Therefore, I'm not going to set up a training for that quarter. Mm. Or equally, you know, summer kids are off. It's frenetic. So therefore, I need something to ground me. I'm going to train people in the mm. summer, you know, mm -hmm. um, to have a sense for where the energy is in all the areas of your life. And then don't be an idiot about it, right? Like don't overtax in all areas of your life at the same time. Now, there's a lot of that that we can't necessarily change ourselves. Like I can't change when my kids have summer vacation or not. So you have to figure out which of the things are sort of in stone and which are the things that you can move around. Um, but the idea being that it's not forever and you can literally any day you can wake up and be like, all right, that season is over new mm -hmm. season time mm -hmm. and that disruption is enough to say as of today i do this i don't mm -hmm. do this i am starting to be in this way and it's also something that i coach um i coach clients on who are looking to again like show up one day to the next as a different kind of manager maybe they mm -hmm. read a book or maybe they got coaching from me and they're like okay okay i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to show up and i'm going to give feedback or whatever right <laughs> and so then i say great and the, but the 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 anxiety is how will people perceive this new version of me, right? Like, how mm. do I come back in differently? And yeah. so I always say, you just need a disruption. Like you need a weekend. Mm. And then mm. you say, you know what I was thinking about over the weekend? I'd like to get better at feedback. So therefore, as of today, I'm going to be better, right? Like mm. it's so funny, and It could be the tiniest thing. I read I like a book. It. I listened to a podcast. Mm. I had a dream, like whatever. Mm. You just need something that disrupted. And then people allow you social cred to change yeah. Yeah. and I so like seasons i think uh, I, I come love, to mind I, I love that. yeah so instead of like perfect I, I feel like my model whether i was taught or not was like everything has to be balanced and you know? so you, it's almost like you got to be the perfect parent you got to be the perfect this you got to be the in and the, the idea of the of the season and we're always in a season right so it's it's finding Absolutely. the balance in the season but um i guess the other thing that comes to mind is like, have you ever driven one of those cars with lane assist, you know, or if you're getting too far out of the lane? I, I really don't like those. I, I thought there was a yeah. problem. First time I did that, I thought there was a problem with the car. Apparently, I'm just a bad driver, Jen. I think that's what it is. But <laughs> but there seems like even in the season, we need to know when we're heading towards a cliff. You know, yeah. like I could use this as an excuse because I've seen whether it's marriages or uh, yeah. family relationships that look like they fell off a cliff, but they didn't. It was just one day at a time. And the guardrails of when am I using the season excuse, you know, to actually justify mm -hmm. priorities that truthfully I feel different about? So I don't know. Any thoughts on that? No, it's true. I mean, even, even recently in coaching conversations, I've talked to folks about what are their warning signs. Mm. And that could be what is a warning sign for burnout or what is a warning sign for a need to change? You know, what makes it good. And so often people will say, well, um, I have a hard time making decisions or I'm, I'm tired by lunchtime mm. or I can't focus or, you know, and so whatever this person says, I say, okay, great. We're going to write that down as a tool. So your body gives you that tool and mm. your body is saying, yo, psst, something's up. Mm -hmm. So when's the last time you heard that? from your body. Right. And so then we can track, tell me about some of the times in your past when you, when you felt like, you know, you couldn't work after lunch or whatever, what did you do? How did you get back on track? And really what I think so much about coaching Andy is that, um, you have experienced so much wisdom in your life already. And so even the situations that we think are brand new, Oh God, I'm a manager guess what? At some point you went from elementary school to middle school. That was an identity moment. You were like, Oh God, I'm a middle yeah. schooler. And you figured it out. And so to have someone, again, my capacity is coaching, but it could be other, you know, support systems in your life, but to have someone say, tell me about another time when you changed identity, mm -hmm. what helped, what didn't help, mm -hmm. how do we use the wisdom of that in this current situation, because it's like, we just have to remind you, you have muscle here. You mm -hmm. know, you've, you've done something like that before. And in that way, I mean, I don't want to over dramatize here, but pretty much anything that comes up in our lives, we have had some hint of it at some point in the past. Mm -hmm. So therefore we're, we're pretty well armed. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. going to be stretching and growing, but by and large, you know, by the time we're in our in the workforce, we've lived a lot of stuff, and we can count on the fact that that previous version of ourself is a a real support system to our future self as well. 
But yeah, it's a great perspective. You know, you and I have kind of hinted that we're going to talk about this, but mm -hmm. there's just, I, I, I've been getting so many calls from people or emails from people that uh, just high quality, talented people that are looking for jobs now out of the, and a yeah. couple of them out of the blue, like they had no clue that this was coming their way. And yeah. But regardless whether they did or not, I mean, it's an uncertain job market. It can feel overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And you and your company are a lot of times of trying to help people move forward. And people don't feel like, I don't know how to move forward in this. So any go-to advice for people who are newly in the job market to help them? Well, the first thing I'll say is there's a free career planner guide. And I'll send you the link after this. Yeah. Maybe you put in the show notes sure. for people who've been laid off. Yeah. And I, I just made that a couple months ago because of what you're citing, because yeah. it's a really strange year. Um, and there are a lot of people affected by this. I might want to reach back five minutes and say seasons again feel relevant mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. right. which is to reassure people that one day it'll be your first day at a new job. Right. Right. And so all you have to do is hang in until that first day of your new job. And what are you going to do from now till then? Well, probably you're going to, you know, grieve and then you're going to look for jobs. You probably have some coffees, you know, you'll go on LinkedIn and talk to recruiters or whatever that path looks like. But it is a finite amount of time that you need to hang in there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that feeling that it's not just like dot, dot, dot ellipses forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the reminder that it will be over one day uh, is a really helpful frame for folks in that. And it, it's it's destabilizing. It's overwhelming. Like you said, it's very often not for performance reasons. Right. And so... People have all kinds of interpretations for why it was, but regardless, uh, you know, it it will be over. And mm -hmm. so I think just to remember that is a gift you can, I don't know, sit with right now. I think, I really think so. And I've had those conversations with people. I know there's going to be the day when you're going to start yeah. the job. Like, I know, but I don't feel it. On this I side know. of the valley, we, don't, we can't see it. But on the other side, it's like, look what I learned during that time. And so we're not trying to discount anybody going through that sort of thing right, right now, nope. but if nothing else, it's like, um, hang in there. Like you're going to learn some lessons through this. I, uh, um, yeah, it's, it is one of those things of keeping the, keeping the mindset. And I like that you actually included the grieving because we had a guest in the podcast years back. She goes, when something bad happens, I give myself 24 hours to wallow in it. and just like, feel bad. Just, you know, just act like a kid and feel bad. But then after 24 hours, I get back at it. And I think there's actually some wisdom in what she said there, but I think there's also pressure sometimes to like get over it. Yeah. And I, th I think there is a grieving process that goes through difficult things like this, that you don't have to get over it in 24 hours. Any thoughts on it? No. I mean, I think you can make up how many hours you want it yeah. to be. Yeah. And also it depends on the severity probably of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that there is a little bit of like, suck it up, get it together. I mean, yeah. I'm from New York, so that is very much my vibe. Like I allow myself to touch down and then I'm like, all right, yeah. now what are we doing again? Yeah. Um, and, and that's certainly helpful because any anxiety you have about secretly ending up lazy and never getting off your couch again, you're probably, none of us, that would not happen to any of us who are listening to this podcast. This is right. freaking project managers. Right. For, right. You know, crying out loud. Right. Right. But sometimes there's still that fear. Like, well, if I took a vacation day, would I ever go back? You mm -hmm. know, this like, which is probably a real warning sign anyway. But, <laughs> you know, if, yeah. if your anxiety there um, is that you don't even want to let yourself grieve a little bit. I think it's going to come back and bite you, mm -hmm. you know? So allow yourself to kind of sit in it. Another thing you were saying something a minute ago that reminded me that sometimes when I'm coaching someone who happens to be going through like a really prickly time with their team, I always say, let us just imagine that two years from now, you're giving a keynote and looking back, you're, you're literally like building the slides right now. Mm -hmm. You're living through the slide building. And we don't know what the answer is going to be for what you do with this team, mm -hmm. but you're going to get an answer. And then let's just imagine you're going to give a keynote about it. And you're like a thought mm -hmm. leader and you're on TED mm -hmm. Talks and whatever. Mm -hmm. So a similar vibe here where you're living through the slides of having been laid off. Yeah. And it's the story building time. And at some point that story will turn and it can be hard to have faith in that. I really do get it. But maybe people even hearing me and you say that that's possible, maybe they'll 
Yeah. Take that yeah. a little to heart. Thank you for sharing that. That's a lovely way of thinking it through. Now, that's for the person who doesn't have the job, but there's, I just talked to somebody in this last week. They're like, I have a job, yeah. but I don't know if I should stay. Now, in this person's case, it's because they felt like it was um, toxic with coworkers, mm. you know, but I don't know. I'm curious. Do you have any thoughts about when is it time to leave a job in your opinion? And you know, it all depends, but I mean, what, what are your thoughts right. about this? Well, the, I'll append to it all depends, right? Like we'll be our, we'll be the dads in our lives or at least my dad, which is like, do you have savings? <laughs> uh, like, do you have healthcare? You know, right, yeah, like yeah. be the responsible, let's just assume all those responsibilities are covered. It's funny you use the word toxic. That's what I wrote down when thinking about this yesterday. Um, I would say that there's, uh, you know, like if you think about a scale, like two mm-hmm. sides of a scale and one side is up and one side is down. And let's just say that the one that's up is your job because it's fulfilling and you enjoy it. And if that is less and less true and we start to see that side go down, Mm. the minute that the other side goes above, which means don't work here side, goes above the benefit of working here, there is a moment of reflection that should happen, which is probably true for any decision making, right? Mm. Like at what moment does staying feel worse than going um, in this grand scheme of things. So toxicity um, sure makes that rebalancing go faster. And Mm -hmm. when you are having more harm done to you by staying than than, um, by leaving, then that probably is a sign that a departure is imminent. I would also say from kind of the other angle If you're looking at a team and there is a person who is toxic, um, and by that, I really just mean like not aligned and clearly Mm -hmm. not in the right job. Mm -hmm. The impact that one person who is not aligned and not in the right job and having toxic behavior can have on the team around you, like that's a finite amount of time too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes choosing a departure, choosing someone to be laid off Mm -hmm. in that moment is... It feels bad, but it's a, it's actually a relief to a lot of folks around them. Mm. And so I think there's something in that too, where, where, at what moment is the person, their benefit to the team is lower than their, their, you know, sort of, um, uh, bonus to the team, right. Or, or Mm -hmm. the positives on the team. And, and that feels like a similar decision to me that when it comes to that level of decisions, it's, it's, uh. It's kind of a balance question. I like it. Yeah. And I like that metaphor of kind of thinking of where's the, where's the balance. We had a guest yeah. in the podcast who said, if you're asking that question, it's probably, you should have been asking it earlier. <laughs> like you're probably late <laughs> in the game, which I thought was kind of an interesting <laughs> thing because I think we, we often make this a two state thing, stay, go, mm. but really there's all kinds of third and fourth options here. I might be one of those, yeah. Hey, stay. Start talking to recruiters, right? You don't have to say yes, you know, just start looking around. There's, 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 yeah. there are often more options available. And it could be that, uh, that upon reflection, this is better than what might be out there, <laughs> but, but totally. there's something empowering about saying I'm not a victim. And, uh, there's, I have a little bit of agency here of looking at some other options, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you want a different team. Don't leave the company, leave the team. Or maybe there's uh, a different role that actually Mm -hmm. speaks to you. I was talking to someone the other week who is in uh, like the financial vertical of her large organization. And she's been really, really, really curious about people operations for so long. Mm. And the we talked about the culture, whether they are welcoming of folks that want to sidestep. Mm. In that case, not uh, they do not sound very welcoming. And so I was like, peace out you should get out of there you know yeah, and try yeah. something else but yeah. in many places they are yeah, and it is yeah. possible to to go and share that reasonable request with someone and say i really love the company but i'm finding myself really curious about this other role and i see there's one opening is it yeah. possible for me to find out some more information nothing yeah. wrong with that yeah that's great advice you know you're not a project manager by title but for your whole career you've had to deliver things so Uh, What are some of the most important lessons you've learned about successfully leading or delivering projects? I think expectations is the word that comes to mind here. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you understand what they want 
and check in often. So there's an initial, we'll just take what I assume is the project manager kind of timeline, right? Where you um, sell a piece of work and then you have kickoff and then eventually you deliver something. Mm -hmm. So whatever that statement of work is in the beginning, whatever that piece of work is, everybody should be real clear on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> real clear on when mm -hmm. we start, real clear on the pacing that will go and then check in along the way. Hey, here's how, here's what we're up to. Is that like not just on a week to week stand up basis, but more just like, hey, let's just point a contact, point a contact, meet every once in a while. How's this feeling for you over there? Mm -hmm. Is this going the way you thought? You know, any feedback so far? You can tell that even my tone right there went a little like chiller mm -hmm. because what I'm trying to say is like, let's talk meta a little bit about this mm -hmm. relationship, not just like how's ticket 707, you know? <laughs> um, and so when it comes to that kind of relationship in a services business, you are going to need to report back on tangibles, but also it is majorly in your benefit as the provider to uh, make sure that relationship is tracking. Because then mm -hmm. if 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 things get derailed or there has to be bad news delivered or things are late or whatever, you have a relationship to fall back on. There's more trust there. And so it's not as big a deal as if it's so cold vendor, you know, and, and client. That's good. That's good. You know, the textbooks would say, you know, things like have your scope documents and have, uh, you know, controls yeah. in place and things like that. But it, it, it easily misses what you bring up is such an important point about the dirty little secret is everything's relationships. Yeah. Yes. If, oh if, God, we've, yes. if we've got a stronger relationship there, uh, informational flow, um, uh, maybe more motivation, you know, oh, more yeah. honest conversation. So yeah, that's such a practical lesson, Jen, that's so easily missed. Yeah, you know, I'm on the PTA at my kid's school, yeah. and you, I'm sure, have this in your life too, but the first person that I made friends with was the lady in the main office. <laughs> if you don't have her in your pocket, you're screwed. Oh, you can't yeah. get tables, you can't yeah. get people's emails, you know, oh, like nothing like that. And so point of contacts are the most valuable time you oh, could yeah. spend in relationship building. Yeah, yeah, every once in a while. I don't hear it very often, but every once in a while I'll say, Oh, don't worry, they're just an admin. Like, oh, oh god. Just an admin. You mess with an admin. You know, it's amazing yeah. how the somebody can exactly they can yes. hurt you by doing nothing. You know, oh it, my it's god. so uh, yes. uh, that, this that, is that, 101, kids. Whoever's listening. Management. Exactly. 101. But, it's, but it's for project management, it's stakeholder management, you know. So yeah, yes. yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. good advice. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of parents who listen to the podcast and you know. I, uh, I think, let's see, if I did the math based on what you said before, you must have an uh, early teenager now, do you? Uh, seven and 10. Okay. All right. right, right yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, but that's that's a different age than when you first were, you know, had yeah. the tumor incident. So what are yeah. some, can you think of any ways that you apply what you teach and coach at work to life at home? Well, it'd be really charming if it all just worked like perfectly, like my wisdom in coaching was taken as wisdom in parenting to my children. Uh, really? So first I'll be real about that. Oh. I think, um, you know, you're reminding me of a day when my older son probably was second grade or so, maybe seven, eight years old. And I remember walking through the schoolyard with him and I said, you know, sometimes I look at a whole crowd of people like this and I wonder um, what people used to tell them about what they could be. Mm. And he said, yeah, like, you know, he's kind of up on this level of conversation. He was like, oh yeah, like how sometimes people say girls can't do math. And I was mm. like, yeah, exactly. That's something he had learned about in school. Or how, he was like, first graders can't skateboard, which he liked to skateboard. So I was like, yes, you're right. You can totally skateboard. And I said, the thing is, Noah, if you look around the whole world and you see all these grownups who are bringing their kids today, somebody told them at some point that they could do something or couldn't do something. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they believed it for a mm. really long time or forever. So what I think the reason that story comes to mind is that it is true for every single person in our offices, our points of contact, the people who report to us and who we report to is that at some point they got messaging. Hopefully it was all, you know, realistic and amazingly inspiring, but probably there were also some dingers in there. And mm -hmm. I think it's important also in self-reflection to wonder, what am I a product of? And is that still who I want to be? Mm -hmm. So with parenting, obviously I think about that a lot with what am I um, sort of 
negating for them or what am I just sort of leaving permission? And, uh, you know, there's still seven and 10, so it remains to be seen, but so far so good. You know, I'm, I'm even thinking of your advice earlier about when someone would bring us bad news. Like if a kid says something like, you know, hey, mommy, I, I'm thinking about this someday. And mm -hmm. um, instead of like, no, <laughs> or oh, that you'll never be able to make a living or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. I, yes. I, I, I love the line that you shared and we've heard it from other guests in various ways, but like, tell me more. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Tell me more. What a different, what a different reaction from a parent then, yeah. oh, come on, get real. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. yeah. And I mean, again, full circle here, that is a fear-based response. Mm. When someone says, you'll never make a living, uh, very obviously you're worried about your kid making a living one day, you know, or like in our family, we don't do that. Very obviously you mm. are busted because you want to do something else and somebody told you you couldn't, you know, like mm. we are so transparent in those moments, Andy, about what our own fears are. So take a beat before you decide to, you know, splay your therapy issues on your children, <laughs> um, you know, and, and just make sure that what you are doing is listening more than telling in those mm -hmm. moments, because, you know, as my boys get older, there's certainly less and less, uh, just like, you know, opening their hearts and sharing all their thoughts. And so my, again, I don't have teenagers yet, but my, my thought is any opportunity that they might bring something to me to hold a very open space for that and not try to maneuver in any way, but rather to like, listen and, and allow them to say more things to your point. Yeah. yeah I love it. Yeah. If someone wanted to follow up with you and go, Hey, Jen, I want to follow up with you on the question, whether it's um, a question about something from today or just any of the training you do, what's the best way for someone to contact you? I'll give you two ways. The first would probably be my website, mm. beplucky.com. So that's beplucky.com. Uh, that'll probably be in the show notes. And the other thing is you can just write me an email. Hello mm. at beplucky.com. I I love when people email me. I always write them back and it's very charming. And, you know, y'all can have a question or or even resonate or not disagree. Give me some hard feedback. That's okay. You mm. know, I, I have to take my lumps when I give my advice too. So uh, mm. yeah, be more than happy to hear from anybody and uh, you know, very friendly to the world here. That's great. Well, Jen, I enjoyed today's conversation. Thanks for joining us on the People and Projects podcast. Thanks for having me.